so thank you, Liz, for organizing everything. And thank you, Viva, again. Uh, so my name is uh, Richard Freeman. Um, so my background is uh, I have a PhD in machine learning. And um, I did a while back. So this was a long time ago, which I completed in 2004. Then I joined uh, Capgemini, which is a big consultancy. Uh, for about six years. So I moved from being a developer up to a solutions architect. Uh, and then I joined Michael Page briefly for as a data engineer and data architect. And I've been with Just Giving for about um, three and a half years now, coming up to four years. Um, I'll introduce the company in shortly in, in some of the slides, That's just to give some background. So what we're going to talk about today, um, let's talk about some of the AWS services, talk about the event-driven platform that we have at Just Giving. Um, introduce you into detail into serverless computing, talk about six different patterns that you can use within your organization, and then I'll talk about any of the recommendations and best practices. So first, I'd like to get a, a show of hands. Uh, how many people have used serverless technology or know what serverless is? So, levanta la mano. Yeah, okay, that's a good number. Uh, so how many people have used, um, another show of hands, how many people have used the Lambda functions, AWS Lambda? Great, that's a good number. Okay, so there's still a few people that haven't, so I'm going to still go over some of those services for you. So S3, so S3 is a distributed data store, so you can think of it as a, a drive where you can add lots and lots of data and only pay for the amount of data that's actually stored on there, so you pay for what you use. It supports encryption, so there's three types of encryption. So you can do client-side encryption, you can do um, server-side encryption, where Amazon maintains the key, and you've also got encryption using your own key, but on the <laughs> server. Uh, it's highly scalable and reliable, um, and it uses a distributed storage it also supports uh, running static websites, for example. Um, DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL data store, so it's a key value pair store, so you can actually provide um, a specific key and you can retrieve rows really fast or add new rows. Um, it supports any data volumes and it uses uh, SSD storage, so it's very fast. SNS over there. Um, so SNS is based on topic, so you can actually uh, do like a publish to a specific topic and then all the subscribers actually uh, receive the message. So this message gets forwarded, um, it could be for example a queue, you could get an email, uh, you could get a text message. Uh, and it supports multiple devices, um, including the mobile for pushing data. AWS Lambda, as most of you used already, is just running code in response to some trigger. So the trigger could be, for example, a file gets added to S3, specific records added to Dynamo, or an SNS message is sent, and that actually triggers your code. It's one of the key components to serverless technologies. Um, and, it, and it's also great because you only pay for the duration of the execution of that specific code. It automatically scales and is highly available. So unlike other systems where you need to have the capacity ahead of time, uh, the lander will scale uh, based on the, the number of calls. So. so the other three systems I want to talk about, uh, so here we've got Kinesis Streams. So Kinesis Streams is, allows you to build um, your own pipeline for ingesting streaming analytics data. Um, so the idea is you've got um, a service like a pipe and you're actually pushing lots and lots of events those events get captured and they get stored for up to seven days. Kinesis Firehose is a service which is an endpoint which allows you to aggregate in memory uh, a set of data <laughs> and that data gets persisted into S3 and it can get also loaded into Redshift or Elasticsearch. So again, it's, this is more the capture and the temporary storage. This is more the persistence of lots and lots of data in a very cheap mechanism. On the right, so we've got um, a fairly new system, so which is Kinesis Analytics, which is a way of actually querying the data that's stored in the Kinesis streams using SQL. So you can, for example, run different counters. Um, so if this data was web analytics data, you could count the number of page views, for example, um, aggregate them over time, and then have like a, a window that would provide that data. Okay. So now we're going to talk a bit about the Just Giving data platform. So Just Giving is uh, what we call a tech for good company. 
we work with charities and fundraisers uh, and crowdfunding for good projects. So in uh, the UK and the US, there's actually um, a concept called fundraising. So this is where um, one individual um, who really cares about charity uh, wants to raise money for that charity. So what they do is they run, for example, a marathon or do a swimming competition and then ask their friends, family, colleagues, anybody they know, neighbors, um, to actually sponsor them online. Um, in the past, this used to be like a sheet of paper you would take around and give cash donations. Um, in 2001, we created Just Giving, which was an online platform. So we actually captured the, um, we provided the donation platform for that. And we've been uh, running successfully ever since. Um, so we're actually the number one platform in social giving in the world. Um, and we support, uh, we've raised actually $4.2 billion to date, so since 2001. So you think about $4.2 billion going to good causes, um, to good donations, so that's what we've provided. We've got 28.5 million users who have used the platform in almost every country in the world. And we've got 27,000 good causes that we serve. Um, and if you think about, um, I don't know if you've heard about this in Spain, but we've had uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge, for example. This is where people decided to um, fill a bucket of cold water, put some ice, and pour it over their head in order to raise money. So we had a huge peak of traffic, so you can see the picture there. Um, so again, our infrastructure runs on AWS, and that allows us to scale out very quickly. Any natural disasters that happens, lots of people want to raise money on the platform. Um, so this is our motto, to ensure that no good cause goes unfunded. So again, it's about connecting the charities, what the charities do with the specific users. How do we ensure that no good cause goes unfunded? We actually serve content that is relevant to the users, so something they're really interested in, passionate about, a bit like what Facebook does. They try to show you what's relevant, what's interesting. Um, so showing that, you actually need to understand the graph. So we've got one of the biggest graphs in the social giving space. So we've got half a billion relationships, 91 million nodes. Um, and here you can see a little piece of what we call the give graph which integrates with Facebook. We've put Facebook data, we've got our own data, and um, charity data. So just to give you another idea, so this is what we call one of our products, which is the fundraising page. So you can see Sophie's actually running um, a half marathon. Um, so there is a page, there's a specific story, there's various um, social interactions, and there's also supporter comments. So as they donate money, they can post a comment. Um, Behind all of this, we have lots of uh, data science. So, for example, based on Sophie's past interactions with the site, um, we actually predict how much Sophie can raise on the platform based on the past history, based on the past interactions. Um, so this is actually an intelligent value. So we're using some data science behind that. We also provide some advice around the story and the different types of images. So we're looking at almost what makes the perfect page in order to raise more money for charities. So that's some of the data science behind that. So in order to do that, we have a feedback loop. So we actually capture a lot of the behavioral analytics. So this could be, for example, the page views, what people will click on, and um, impressions. So anything that we show the user, do they actually click on it? We try to understand. OK. So this is a bit more about our platform. So. Initially, uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, we were running a lot of queries in SQL Server, our older dead warehouse. So we were hitting issues around uh, running more and more complex queries. So as we started to grow our data science team, we needed to run very complex queries that took maybe four, 10 hours, or four hours. Um, and that was a problem because it was affecting the existing data warehouse loads, which was reporting, for example, the financial data. Um, the other requirement that we had for our big data platform was to ingest new data sources very easily. So we had the API data, for example. So we look at our marketing data that we want to capture, uh, clickstream data, so this is the web analytics data, any unstructured data, so this could be news data, for example, and also the behavioral analytics. So again, this is trying to understand how the user is interacting with the website. Um, and these are really the, um, the important long-running queries, and more data sources. And I started off as a data scientist in Just Giving, and I found I spent a lot of time on preparing the data many times. So preparation is 
the raw data needs to be transformed for the machine learning algorithms to run. So we just wanted an easy way to do this. So um, this is a very high level view of what we do. Um, so we've got a data ingestion process, then we prepare the data, make sure it's in the right shape for our machine learning and graph algorithms to run, um, as well as our NLP algorithms. So for example, we can take in different charity comments, different descriptions of charities and try and understand um, in terms of a graph, what does the charity actually do? So for example, UNICEF could be decomposed automatically into uh, helping children in need um, internationally and in specific regions around the world. Um, we also do some streaming processing, which I'll talk about. Uh, this is sort of the engineering view. Um, but actually the, the senior management are usually interested in this view, which is if you call yourself, for example, a data-driven organization, these are sort of the points that I like to talk about. So we've got the metrics. So this is more the counts. So this could be, for example, the page views, number of times people click on the specific donate. Um, and this is more like counting and averages. So this is less complex. It's easier, I'd say, to calculate usually. Uh, it's got lower impact. Again, it's probably internal metrics. Insight is um, what you could call cohort analysis or you've got different funnels. So from this page view, from sending out this email, how many people actually interact with the website, how many people actually end up uh, donating or checking out or actually paying for you know, what your e-commerce site is offering. Um, this is what we call insight. Then we've got predictions. So this is what we're trying to predict what the action is going to be next. So again, um, how do you actually do in a prediction? The best way is to, for example, use A-B testing where you're actually trying to compare two different scenarios. One scenario is like the default one, the intuition tells you. Another one is B is the machine learning algorithm. And that's how you can actually quantitatively show how well an algorithm is doing. Inspiration is where we're actually, here we're using the give graph. So again, we're doing graph analytics to actually serve relevant content. And I found this one's a lot harder, but highly impactful because we're sharing relevant content because we understand the user more and more as we go up the journey. Um, these two are more user facing. Some of this is, this is internal, more internal, I'd say. Okay. So in order to meet those requirements I just talked about, we built uh, a platform called Raven, which stands for uh, Reporting, Visualization, Experimental Networks. So this is um, using technology, which is a bit different from a traditional BI ETL stack. We're actually using event-driven um, architecture. So event-driven is more where you're sending messages out uh, rather than drawing out a big workflow. Um, so traditional, you'll see even in the big data tools, things like Luigi or other um, tools like Airflow, um, a lot of other vendors, you'll see they use direct acyclic graphs or workflows. You're actually drawing out the whole workflow um, manually. If there's any changes on one end or change on the data source, you actually need to propagate that change. If there's a broken flow within that workflow, you need to replay it. So there's a lot of complexity. In Raven, we've actually using event-driven um, architecture as well as some of the serverless pipelines to actually ingest the data and to uh, run some of the, um, the ETL that we do and, and machine learning. Um, Again, through using event-driven architecture, it gives you a lot of flexibility, so I'll show you in the, in the next slide. Um, the end result is that we have raw data that can be consumed by any users, as well as what we call data blocks. Data block is essentially an aggregation of all the data to make it very easy for analysts or people who are, less, who are not SQL experts or developers to actually query. And it provides um, a very simple view on the data. For example, we have data blocks around the web analytics data, which shows you down to the session what a user is doing. Are they a repeat user? Have they come back? How long was their session? So that's all aggregated up. So rather than having a specific page view and a set of clicks, we aggregate everything up into one row per session. We've got other ones like around the CRM interactions, for example, with email. Um, there's various metrics and insights and reports also that we provide back to the business. Um, and the management are always very keen on understanding uh, the metrics, obviously. Every product that we release and every update that we do is actually tested through an AB service um, system. So we actually, again, if we're releasing, for example, I showed the fundraising page earlier. If we're releasing a new feature, such as supporting updates for the user, so the, uh, as, the, um, as the fundraiser is fundraising, they want to show 
um, their training steps, then we actually test that feature. Uh, so A, group A of the web users who visit the site, they, they get the feature, and group B don't get the feature. And then we can show the uplift almost. OK, so this is a high level view of the Raven platform. So on the top left, we've got the web analytics data. Uh, so we're currently using KISS metrics for the client web analytics. So this is like browser, JavaScript capture, all the interactions. We're using Amazon Kinesis for uh, the server side web analytics. We've got Logstash also, so we've got the web logs. Qualaroo is actually for uh, mini surveys that appear within a context. Then we've got external data sources. So these data sources here are more API based. So we bring in Twitter data, exact target, survey monkey, and various other sources. News feeds, for example. At the bottom, we have um, OLTP data, so traditional data warehouse and um, the live databases, OLTP. Um, so this is uh, the data warehouse that didn't scale, I said. What we're doing is we're bringing in all this data almost into one platform, uh, loading it into Redshift, again, using all these services. So I'm going to show one breakdown of this and some of the streaming. Um, and you can see. This is the data layer, so this is where actually we're storing the data. Um, so we've got everything is always mastered in S3, and then we have clusters up for specific purposes of Redshift. We've got Dynamo also for some of the state, and uh, Elastic MapReduce for some of the jobs that we run. So Elastic MapReduce is a managed Hadoop cluster for in, in the AWS platform. So again, it's very easy to spin up a cluster, to install Spark, and then to submit a job. Almost there's no management around it. On the right, we've got the actual consumers almost. So as I said, we've got, um, for example, our data block around the web sessions here. We can hook that up into Python, run our machine learning straight on that. Um, we're also using R, and we also connect directly with SQL. For the business users, we have Tableau currently. We're going to switch to Power BI, um, and that connects straight to Redshift. We can also spin up transient clusters for specific jobs using Spark. Um, and for the streaming analytics I'll talk about today, uh, we're using Lambda there and there, so for the ingestion. Okay, so this is a, it's a nice diagram which shows you what I could talk about event driven ETL. So this is where we've got an external API and we want to load that into Redshift. A typical way of doing this is actually to take the, take the write to service, write it straight into Redshift. The problem is um, Redshift currently takes time to resize, so it goes into read-only mode, and also it goes to maintenance mode once a week, which means you can't write to it, which means you need to build more and more logic in this component. So what I've done here is have a service here that takes the data from the external API and then writes it into S3 and then sends a message to a topic. The topic has a pub sub, so the message gets forwarded on to one of these queues here. And then you have another service that just listens to the queue and proceeds to execute the copy command to actually load the data. So you've effectively decoupled the, um, the compute from the storage or the consumer of the data, the, um, the one that produces the data from the end, um, end cluster where it ends up. It also allows you to spin up more and more clusters. You just need to add another queue, another one of these services that loads the data, and then you have another Redshift cluster. And this can be replicated for EMR on Spark, or if you have a Hive cluster, for example. Uh, with a Hive Metastore, you can also have Spark, so you can do it that way. Um, the beauty is you can turn off, if you're resizing Redshift, you just turn off this service. Everything stays on the queue, so it supports incremental loads as well as batch. Um, so if I need to spin up a new cluster from scratch, I can actually just send messages to reload everything, reload all the schemas, and that will get rebuilt there also dynamically. So the pros are I've decoupled the loading from the ETL and the ELT. So ELT is the, the big data ETL where you attach the schema after read almost. Adds a lot of flexibility to the loading. Again, we can load various sources. Again, you know, this service knows what data is coming in, so it's just part of the payload. Uh, so this is the metadata that goes through. <clears throat> so you can see it supports multi-incremental load to multiple clusters. Uh, any failures, we just send another message. Again, we can track those messages very easily. Um, we've got a Tableau dashboard that actually shows all the loads, and we've got account messages. 
And again, if there's an exception, we can just send a message and that's it. There's no workflow to go and look, um, restart a specific step. So it's, it's very easy. Um, basic sequencing works really well. So we actually have process to, um, for example, load data into Redshift and then initiate some SQL. Um, to update some scripts, so that's possible. Again, it does not support complex workflows, so if you really do want to do uh, directed acyclic glass or workflow, it's probably not the best pattern. Um, but we found it works for almost all of our scenarios, so that's, that's what we're using. Um, until recently, FIFO also, so when I was at the reInvent, FIFO wasn't really released, it was just about released a week before. Uh, FIFO stands for first in, first out, which means the first message that you send on the queue is going to be the first that's read. So first in, first out. Um, so just think about um, implementing the FIFO now. That's available since November. OK, so now I'm going to, I've talked about some of the uh, event-driven ETL. So I'm going to cover the serverless computing in more detail now. Uh, so this is a diagram that um, it's quite interesting, it's quite an overview, so some of you are probably aware of it. Uh, an AWS Lambda there, so we've got the data sources that get captured, so we've got different triggers which are data driven, so you've got S3. S3 could be um, data is added to S3, so you get a put trigger, and that triggers your Lambda code. Um, for Kinesis and Dynamo, it's slightly different, uh, you get micro batches, so this is um, for example, you would get 10,000 records that have been added to Kinesis Streams. The lander will be invoked with 10,000 records, and then you can proceed to iterate over, over the data. Um, the other way is, is to use Alexa Skills or API Gateway to actually invoke the lander function. So API Gateway is a managed API which Amazon offers, which allows you to serve, for example, a post, a get, request, and that invokes the lander function. <clears throat> There's other things, so you've got code commit, which is a bit like GitHub, when someone checks in something, that can make a trigger. Also CloudWatch, so any changes to the monitoring metrics in Amazon can trigger a Lambda function. Um, SNS and cron, cron events also are other triggers that are available. Again, there's many others that are around. Um, so what is the function? The function is, um, you could describe it almost just as the business logic behind what you want to do with this data. Um, the connection between this and the lander is already created for you, so there's nothing, um, yeah, there's nothing you need to do for that. So you receive the data in here, and then you can choose almost what SDK to use. Um, so I tend to use more Python. I started with Node. Um, probably I started with Node maybe about a year and a half ago, and that's when I started publishing a blog around how to do it. Um, and then through the process, I switched to Python, so then... Um, by the end of my blog on the, on the Amazon uh, Big Data blog, uh, I switched to Python actually for that. So here you can do whatever you want almost within the Lambda. Yep, welcome. <laughs> it's okay. You just started to serve this bit. Um, okay, so what are the basics of the AWS Lambda? So you need to think about. Um, the SDK that's available, there's also a role. A role is basically, um, for example, you have read permission to read from S3, but you don't have write permission. So you have write permission to write to Dynamo, for example. So you could be reading a lot of data files from your storage and then writing some counts into Dynamo, or you could be reading off Kinesis Streams or Web Analytics, like what we do, and then writing accounts to DynamoDB. So you don't have a mixed um, ability. So, talk, so um, C Sharp got re reintroduced in the reInvent, so that's the new language uh, that's supported. Started with Node, then went to Python and Java 8. So it handles all the inbound traffic, which is, which is really useful. It's stateless, so you need to almost think differently. So you mustn't maintain state within uh, the lander itself. The lander has a, a lifetime of five minutes. After that, it's gone. So it's almost spun up based on some event. So records have been added. You need to do what you're doing. You need to push this state outside of, the, outside of that lander. Um, so I said duration. There's a limit on terms of the memory also. Um, so uh, the, the more memory you provide, the, the faster it is almost to process. Um, but there's a cost. So you charge per 100 milliseconds and also per RAM. Um, yep, which is that. 
Uh, this is slightly different from EC2 instances where you're charged per hour. So actually there is an incentive to optimize your code to, to save money. It's familiar. <laughs> yep. It's familiar because you've got access to all the bash. Um, you can bring your own libraries. Again, you can package up um, all the dependencies that you need in Python and C Sharp and then run those again on demand. And this is a table I created just comparing um, um, EC2 machines with containers and with AWS Lambda. Um, so Landers, I think uh, last year, the CTO of Amazon was talking about Landers as the, almost the next big thing after containers. Containers is what's really hot right now. Um, so EC2 instances, you need to think about high availability again. So how do you scale out? If you've got more data coming in, uh, you need to think about resiliency. It's the same for containers. You need to have a cluster running, almost think about the sizing. Um, you've got a lot of choice and flexibility around, for example, the operating systems. Um, so you can choose whether you want Windows or Linux, specific variants of Amazon Linux or Ubuntu, for example. Uh, with Lambda, it's slightly different as uh, you don't need to think about the infrastructure as much. Everything's spun up on demand almost based on the number of requests that you get. Um, your Lambda will start up and then execute what you need to do and then it will shut down for you. Um, there's only one operating system, so it prioritizes ease of use over you know, low level configuration that you want to, to do around the operating system, for example, or different services to install. So there's only, you can't really choose your hardware. You can't remote onto the box to fix anything. There's, there's nothing like that's available. Um, so it's a lot easier to use, I'd say, in that respect. Um, as I said, the scaling, if you're using EC2 instances or containers, you need to think about, um, you need to build that into, into your infrastructure almost. So you need to think about how you create a cluster, for example, if you've got lots of data coming in. Whereas with the lander, that's implicit. Again, it's part of the event sourcing. Uh, so more landers will get spun up, for example. If you have lots of SNS messages coming in, it will spin up one lander per SNS message. If you have uh, Kinesis Streams, um, which has a number of shards. So each shard in Kinesis Streams has a thousand writes per second. So if you have 10 shards, it will spin up to 10 parallel landers and it will be passed a micro batch and then you can execute over there with a for loop. Um, there's also differences in terms of launch time. So you can actually use the lander that can be spun up for a specific requests. So they can spin up within a microseconds and seconds. So rather than Containers still take seconds to spin up, and uh, EC2 instances will be in the minutes. So again, state, as I talked about earlier, EC2 instances and uh, containers allow you to support state if you need to store state. Usually it's not best practice to have state on a specific machine unless it's a database, because um, then you, you can't scale out as easily. If a machine goes down, you want to spin them up again quickly. Since Lambda doesn't support state because they die after five minutes, it's actually, it makes it very easy to, um, to stay stateless, which is a best practice. In terms of integration um, for EC2 and containers, you need to think about using an SDK, for example, to pull in the data. <clears throat> in the Lambda, almost all the data is provided to you, and it's a question of um, understanding the metadata, or if it's Kinesis streams, to actually iterate over the data. So you get a micro batch, for example, 10,000 records, and you just iterate over those. Um, <clears throat> and then even you do a count, or you can do something and pass on the data. So again, there's that extra step that you don't need to think about. Um, the cost for EC2 instances, again, there's spot instances, but there's still your charge per hour, unless the spot gets killed. But you're still charged per hour, generally. Same for containers. So you've got many EC2 um, instances. You could have several containers on each of those EC2 machines, but there's still a cost to, associated with that. For the Lambda functions, there's, um, you pay per 100 milliseconds, and again, you have to pay per hour. So there's a big difference. So there's a, a big incentive to optimize your code, make sure it runs fast and, and is efficient as possible. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll talk about, so from my experience of using um, AWS Lambda, for about a year and a half to two years, and from writing my, um, my different blog posts, so I'll talk about six patterns that I think will be very useful for you. So the first pattern, um, some of you might have used in the old days uh, what, they, what they call enterprise service bus, or uh, messaging uh, technologies. Uh, in Amazon, so you've got the SNS, 
and you've got the SQS on the other end. And there's no way almost of transforming the message that goes between them. So there is a publish, subscribe connection between the two, but there's no way of doing any routing or transformation. So what I'm showing here is actually, you can just put a lambda between an SNS and an SNS and the SQS, and you can do your transformation of the machine, of the message, um, and then route it to a specific queue. Um, because that relationship is always one-to-one, -one. this is a way of routing or transforming the contents of the meshing. You may want to enrich it, uh, you may want to transform it. And this is a typical pattern you saw maybe 10 years ago with the enterprise service bus, where you used to have almost everything going through a message bus, and you could do this transformation. Um, so this is a simple way to do that. Um, slightly more interesting way is to use Kinesis Streams almost as your message bus. So this is where you would get a micro batch into the lambda and do the routing and transformation of that message. So for example, you could get all the data coming in here for all the department's data and specific client data, but you only want, for example, financial data to go to one specific queue. So that would be quite a nice pattern to use um, this routing for. So Prosa is quite easy to do, very simple to implement. Uh, it's highly available. Um, you centralize some of the business logic again. So the producer of the message uh, that puts the message here doesn't need to worry about where it's going to end up, <coughs> as well as the type of transformation that um, you're interested in. Um, so when you're using Kinesis, you can support more than one message per lambda. If you're using uh, SNS, then um, obviously there's one-to-one -one relationship. So that won't be as scalable. Kinesis Streams also has an interesting feature, which is uh, you can actually replay. So if you've got seven days of data, you can ask for a replay from the beginning of time, which is they call event horizon, or you can choose a specific date range, or you just get the new records. So it allows you to replay almost all your web events in your organization. Um, there are some limits to be aware of. So the lander itself has a 500 megabytes on disk and one and a half gigs of RAM. And again, it needs to complete within those five minutes. Okay, pattern number two. So this is a pattern. So I talked about um, our web analytics front end earlier, or what we call uh, KISS metrics. So we're looking at different ways of replacing that. So this is one of the patterns. So we've got mobile data, browser, backend systems. So we have um, an API gateway. So API gateway I talked about earlier is a managed API by Amazon. And it's built in with uh, security in mind and scalability, highly available. Um, so what we have here is a pattern to, you can write to this endpoint uh, using your JavaScript um, on the client side. And then we're using IAM roles. So the IAM roles allows the API gateway to write to Kinesis Streams. So Kinesis Streams will store all your data. Um, and you have Amazon CloudWatch, which is monitoring. So you can monitor the load on both the API gateway and Amazon Kinesis Streams. Um, again, there's no keys that are exchanged. Everything's managed through roles. Um, roles are basically a way of giving a machine or specific service permissions to read and write uh, different services and to execute. So in this particular case, um, Amazon API Gateway has the right to write to Amazon Kinesis Streams, so the records can go through. So this is pattern number two, which I call the Serverless Streaming Data Capture API. Um, in the past, if you didn't have Kinesis Streams, maybe you use Kafka, but before that, maybe you'd have to think about a highly scalable system that would scale out um, horizontally, so where you'd add more machines, and then you'd have to think about how you cluster out the data load almost to support that. So there'd be some sort of load balancing, and then you'd have lots of machines on the back end to support that. This is purely managed by Amazon, so there's nothing I need to manage in terms of machines. So that's the beauty of the, the serverless side of this pattern. So again, this is a way of capturing in real time any of the data uh, into a pipeline. Once it's in Kinesis Streams, you can process it. So I'll show some patterns after that, how to do that. Uh, very secure, again, everything's configurable using the IAM roles. Um, you can do very simple transformations in API Gateway, but if you want to do something really complex, it's probably not the, not the best way to do it. Um, API Gateway also has a cost, and um, you need to align almost the API Gateway and the Kinesis uh, limits. So for example, if the API gateway can support you know, maybe 10,000 writes per second, if Kinesis 
you don't have the right number of shards, then obviously it won't be able to cope, so you need to be aware of that. Um, again, that's through monitoring and understanding your traffic that that becomes apparent. So again, through, through the CloudWatch metrics, you can actually understand what's happening. You can even see um, an important thing is to think about how the data is distributed on Amazon Kinesis streams also. So um, there's basically a key and that will send the data to a specific shard. So that needs to be well distributed. And CloudWatch allows you to monitor that also. So, okay. So next pattern. So we've moved on from streaming analytics. Now we're talking about files that get dropped into, um, into S3. So imagine this is a pattern that we're using in just giving quite well. So we've got some data. So you've got, imagine a few hundred megs that get dropped every hour, for example, or every evening. Then maybe you don't want to have a machine running just to process that data to do some lightweight transformation. So what you can do in this pattern number three is what I call the serverless data pipeline a small data pipeline because it's small data. So the idea is you've got the data in S3 that triggers a Lambda function. The Lambda function then reads the data from S3, does a transformation, and then writes the data out to S3, sends an SNS message to indicate that um, that data has been added. Um, so once, you, once the data is written on the output side, so this could be a transformation. So let's say web analytics data. Maybe you want to extract different patterns from the URL. Maybe you want to extract patterns from the user agent. For example, you want to see types of browsers on the fly. So you could write the data here and then send a message off. And I talked about, remember, about event-driven ETL earlier. So this is where this is a, an SNS topic. And if we go back to where we were earlier, this diagram, you see that's the topic there. So this topic is a message to say that I've just added data to S3. So that will go to a queue, and then you can load that data into Redshift. So effectively, um, that allows you to load the data almost as it arrives, as it's transformed. So it's a very simple pattern. I recommend it for small, small sets of data. So I've got some of the information here. Um, oh yeah, it also supports a, a batch mechanism. So. What I just showed you was the incremental one. So this is where new data arrives that triggers uh, a Lambda function. You can also scan the whole of S3 and then send one message per file that's in S3 or object in S3 um, that way. And then you've got a parallel set of Lambdas so that execute. Uh, the soft limits of number of Lambdas per account is about 100, but you can increase that to about 1,000. So again, this is a nice way to do it to scan the whole of S3, send a set of messages. Each one does a transformation for each file. So you've got two patterns, which is interesting in there. Um, so what I recommend this is for smaller files, again, infrequently added. So this is uh, a good way to do it. You can actually preserve the original file name, uh, unlike if you use Spark, for example, where you end up with part 0, 1, 2, 3. You can actually preserve the, the original file name because the lander knows the original file name. You're not necessarily distributing it out that way. It's great for if you're projecting specific columns, enriching data, parsing, for example, any of the row level data. So it's better that way around. And you can just chop the columns and change it's lightweight transformations. Again, you need to be aware of the limits in terms of the lambda. So files larger maybe than 400 megabytes is probably not recommended. Um, it's got to complete within the five minutes, obviously. So if you're doing some really heavy transformation, uh, it's better to go to Spark or some other process. Again, you've only got access to one file at that point. Um, so it's a bit more complex to introduce joins, obviously. You've been triggered, your land has been triggered with one file, knowing about one file. So that's sort of the way to do it. Um, one file input and output may, be, may not be desirable. If you have many files added per second, you'll end up with lots of files on the output. It may, may not be what you want to do. So what do I do in that case? You apply pattern number four. So pattern number four is what I call the streamifying uh, a file, and merging it into a larger file. So you can see, similar as before, but we've got maybe a file added every few seconds. Um, that will trigger a lambda function. The lambda function will go through the, uh, the actual file itself, uh, row by row and actually send each of those rows. So each row will go into Kinesis Streams or into DynamoDB, and then from there you can process it further. The alternative, if you want to persist that out into S3, is to actually go through the file row by row, send each row to 
Amazon Kinesis Firehose, which I talked about earlier, which then can persist that data into S3. And then another lander can actually trigger uh, after that a message that then goes onto the queue that we can then load onto Redshift or other systems. So this is quite a nice pattern for transforming data from this side, either turning it into a stream and then analyzing it in streaming analytics way, or actually writing it back into S3, more aggregating lots of data, lots of files into larger files. So those files can be 128 megabytes or up to 15 minutes of data. Um, so like the earlier pattern, there's also a way you can scan the whole of S3 and then send a set of messages. So one message per file, and then you can run the same process so you can actually analyze all the files in parallel, and it's quite um, a quick way of doing it. So pros are we've got both the batch and incremental ways of processing the data. Um, it's very useful for small and frequently added files. Again, you don't have to think about spinning up your Spark cluster or running your EC2 container, uh, your EC2 machines or containers. This is, um, you know, a file gets added to S3, trigger a lander, process the data, write the data out, or send it onto the stream in this case. And the combination of Lambda with Kinesis Firehose is, is a nice um, serverless way to persist a stream. So if you've got lots and lots of data in Kinesis streams, um, this is a good way to do it, I'd say. There's downsides again, I talked about these um, limitations of the Lambda in terms of the size, and in terms of the Firehose also, there's a limit, obviously. If you want to aggregate data larger than 108 megabytes, um, this pattern won't work. And 15 minutes, if you want to aggregate an hour files, then the, look at other, other solutions. Complex joins also aren't supported. Again, it's, it's just how the landers are triggered. So just be aware of that. So the next pattern is, um, this is a way of doing streaming analytics without any infrastructure. So totally serverless way of processing data to actually count data. So for us, for example, what you do is we ingest the web analytics data into Kinesis Streams, and then that will trigger a set of micro batches that will be sent to the Lambda function. And there you can actually do, for example, running counts. So you could count the page views per hour, per minute, um, using Python. You can write that out to CloudWatch Metrics, which is um, a PaaS service that allows you to explore the actual metrics on Amazon. Um, quite easily, again, there's not much to build, so you can plug the lander straight into Kinesis Streams, and then you can do that, and then you've got a dashboard. Um, equally, you can do the counts in here, and, and then write the actual counts into DynamoDB, and then you can serve that using a static website. Uh, so this is a pattern we've found quite useful at just giving. Um, so I've got various dashboards that allow you to query Dynamo, uh, so I've written stuff in Node and JavaScript. Um, which runs on a static website in, uh, in S3. And that will query, again, using Cognito, the actual counts here. And then either you can display them in a, in a chart or into some sort of table. So this is a, it's quite a nice pattern to do it, totally serverless. Again, there's no infrastructure to maintain to do that. Um, alternatively, you can also um, use Amazon Kinesis Analytics. So this is uh, SQL on top of the stream directly and you can persist your results into uh, the Firehose. So the Firehose, as we said earlier, is a way of aggregating lots of data and then writing it out into S3. From there, once it's in S3, again, similar as what we talked about before, so that will trigger a Lambda function, and then you can send an SNS message if you want to load that further downstream into Redshift, or for example, if you want to load it into a Hive table running on EMR. Okay. So again, this is stream processing without any clusters. So there's no Spark streaming um, running or no EMR clusters or any EC2 instances. So I think it's a very good pattern for, for that sort of scenario. Um, so we're using Amazon Kinesis Analytics is another way to do it. So it's a fairly new product, newer product that allows you to run SQL on top of the stream of data. Um, so the idea of persisting the web analytics in uh, DynamoDB also is a way, um, it's a common pattern, so it's something equivalent to what Twitter does, for example. They would aggregate everything into a NoSQL store, 
um, using what they call a lambda architecture, where you're merging the, the batch data with the running counts or the, the streaming analytics. So there's a similar pattern to that. So you can serve up the data really fast in a NoSQL store, and that's what, almost what I recommend. Um, there's general patterns for surfacing the, those counts. Um, so you've got a choice of languages, and so now you've got the SQL on top using the Amazon Kinesis Analytics, uh, as well as the Python, Node.js, uh, C Sharp, and Java 8. And compared for me, compared to, for example, Spark Streaming, you can actually, so Spark Streaming is when you spin up an EMR cluster, which is a managed Hadoop cluster, and then you are streaming the data in, and then you've got an algorithm that does the counting, for example, and then um, you're persisting the counts on an ongoing basis. Um, with using the Lambda approach that I propose here, so you can actually swap out the code without interruptions, without getting any duplicates, without needing to maintain almost a specific position within the streams. Uh, so that can get quite complex. And if you read on the internet about how people do streaming analytics and switch the algorithms, it's not, not as easy. Whereas with the Lambda, the old Lambda stays alive for five minutes and then you get a new set almost. So you don't need to think about that. So it simplifies the problem a lot. Um, again, there's limits to think about if you're doing really complex, um, long, long running uh, analysis on a Lambda function that takes longer than five minutes. Um, then it's not the right solution. Again, it's worth thinking about other solutions. So you could look at uh, um, Spark Streaming, as I said, for example. Um, but if you think about it another way, if, if you're doing real-time analytics and it takes longer than five minutes, then maybe it's not a right solution because five minutes is quite old for streaming analytics. Um, Firehose, again, has the limits, and also it's not suitable for complex joins. So that's where I would look at something on EMR probably to do that. Right. So the last pattern I want to talk about today. So we've talked about the beginning um, about how we're capturing the data, how we're processing the data. And this is more about the presentation of the data. So imagine you've got a, a different service here that actually needs to, for example, get different counts or get a specific um, a view on the data. Then we've got different clients there. Then we have the API gateway uh, which we talked about earlier, which would expose uh, an endpoint that allows you to get data. Um, then we're using uh, a Lambda function that gets triggered to actually go and query uh, DynamoDB. So if you're using DynamoDB, you can use the specific roles to actually read from Dynamo but not write, for example. If you're doing um, RDS, which is uh, a managed uh, SQL server or Oracle or MySQL or, or Postgres, offering by Amazon, then uh, you need to think about the username and passwords uh, for the endpoint, so you can encrypt them in, within here. Um, and also it's tied to VPC, so, um, which is like an isolated area where you can do your computing, you can lock it down for external traffic, for example. Um, so Dynamo allows you to run it using a role, so it's slightly easier, I'd say. As I said earlier, so like the other pattern number two, we've got CloudWatch metrics, so you can monitor the Lambda executions as well as the API gateway consumption. So again, it's a serverless way of surfacing data almost, so it's, it's quite a nice pattern. Um, any type of data, anything in RDS um, or in um, DynamoDB. Yeah, I like DynamoDB, again, it's, I find it's quicker to get up and running using the roles. Um, so you can just get records, you can't do anything else on the data. And that's what the Lambda can do. You've got this choice of language again. You can use Python, Node, C-sharp. Um, and again, you can switch over almost the Lambda code on the fly. So you don't need to think about redeployment. You don't need to think about almost the, the green-blue clusters. Um, so this is when uh, you've got production systems and you want to flip them over. Again, because the, the Lambda's only got a maximum life of five minutes, you can do that quite easily without interrupting any of the existing processes. Um, yeah, I found RDS is good, but you need to think about how you encrypt uh, the username and password and running it in the same VPC, so there's a slight more uh, entry to that. But again, that will give you the flexibility of SQL, so it's a lot richer than Dynamo, where you have to query using a key, and um, like a sort key, and a primary key. Uh, yeah, think about the limits, and obviously if you're doing something really compute intensive, it's probably not the right pattern. But if you want to get something up and running very quickly, this is a nice pattern I'd recommend. Okay, so the serverless 
the recommendations now. So based on our experience, about a year and a half using landers, uh, I've got some tips for you that we were talking about. So I found landers are really good with creating backend microservices. So this is, um, again, the lander gets invoked dynamically and um, that will spin up and then do what it needs to do and return the data. So it's a very quick way of doing that. Um, in addition, you can have I found it really useful when you've got, uh, if you imagine tabular data, you want to go for each row, project a specific column, transform specific columns. It, it's really good at doing that, um, filtering different columns. <clears throat> I found it really good when you're using other AWS services. So this is because, because of that integration of the event uh, triggers that happen, and also the CloudWatch integration. So you really know what's happening to the Lambda. Um, you know that your data is going to get provided to the Lambda. You don't have to worry about creating a, a capture mechanism for producing the data, for example. <coughs> yeah, so it's very secure. So these are the three things that I'll say are really good. It's worth understanding in, in detail. So you've got roles. So roles uh, allow the lander to uh, execute a specific, uh, on a specific resource, so either a read or a specific write. You've got a VPC, which is a um, virtual private cloud. So this is an isolated area, again, where you run a lander. For example, the lander doesn't have access to external traffic. So you can actually keep it within that bounds. And you've got the KMS, which is the key management system, which allows you to encrypt data, decrypt it within a lambda, for example, for anything that's sensitive and keys. Um, again, it's great because it's highly available, auto-scaling. Um, there's a also a simple packaging process uh, I'll talk about in a minute. And again, this concept of for streaming data, you can actually redeploy it on the fly. You don't have to think about uh, different checkpointing mechanisms within the stream. Um, and also, since you can replay specific data in Kinesis, that's quite a good way of, of testing it. Um, okay, so just going over those, those three patterns that I talked about in terms of the streaming data. Um, so some cases where the data is very large, then I, I wouldn't recommend using a lambda. So anything greater than 400 megabytes, um, or where you want to do um, really complex joins amongst many files. So I'd recommend uh, using, do, using Spark. Um, and for number five, I'd say it's a great pattern for real-time analytics and streaming analytics and persisting streams. But again, if you want to do really complex joins between streams, then it's, it's more limiting. Um, See, so anything that you do, you need to think about uh, monitoring the lambda over time. Um, think about the memory, the local disk, and the execution time. Um, so still, I feel there's like limited tooling. It's building up. Uh, more and more, so adding uh, more deployment frameworks, for example, um, there's different ways of packaging up also the landers and redeploying it. Um, throttling, so throttling is when um, the lander's not e able to execute because there's too many running, or you're trying to write to DynamoDB, but there's not enough capacity, so that's when you get throttled. So you need to be aware of that, and if you see that happening, um, you need to think about uh, what's known as a dead letter queue, so DLQ or think about how you handle exceptions, and maybe you need to review the architecture. Um, so as I said, there's some soft limits in terms of the concurrent number of lambdas. So this could be uh, a soft limit, I think initially is 100 uh, concurrent lambdas. You can raise that a lot higher um, based on your requirements. And you need to think about also the number of shards in DynamoDB. If you're writing a lot of data to Kinesis and DynamoDB, you need to monitor over time and allocate the appropriate number of shards. So Kinesis, for example, the shards are about 1,000 writes per shard. So if you need more capacity, add more shards, obviously, which has a cost. But the cost is still minimal, I'll say. Um, yeah, if you're doing anything really complex with lots of joins, again, that's Spark on EMR. That's sort of where I would go to. Um, so there's other two. Um, ORC and Parquet are big data formats. So um, traditionally, it used to be sequence files. Now, um, in the Spark world, Hive world, they're using ORC and Parquet. So this is a way of encoding the data rather than having the, the data in JSON, for example, or in comma-separated fo format. You're actually um, encoding each column or it's compressing it downwards, and then you're creating aggregate statistics where you can jump between different parts of the data. So it's a, it's a big data fi file format that I recommend that you use. Um, Unfortunately, because you don't have all the data available within the Lambda for some of these patterns, you're not able to aggregate and optimize and create uh, ORC files efficiently, I'd say. So that's a better job for Spark on EMR. 
Um, so what I'd like to do with any landers that I produce, we have like a sandbox area where I redirect all the production traffic. Um, then I test my landers using all the possible scenarios, especially we're capturing from many different clients like for the web analytics. So again, the shape of the data can be very variable. Um, think about deployment. So there's a lot of traditional frameworks. So uh, the serverless one was probably the first one. Then there's Chalice, uh, which we talked about reInvent. So that's a, a Python-based framework. This was more Node.js framework. And Amazon have also introduced what they call the SAM, serverless application model. So this is a new framework for deploying the Lambda, packaging up, um, and um, almost creating uh, which cloud formation. You're almost creating a deployment pipeline for Lambdas. So these are, these are sort of areas you need to look at. So you can actually deploy the code with a copy and paste, but obviously that's not recommended if you're going into production. Um, there's also other features that are useful I want to point out. So environment variables. So if you have the same Lambda code deployed in many environments, obviously you want some variables substituted. Or if you have um, an RDS instance with a username and password, then you want to have the environment variables also uh, in there, encrypted, and then decrypt them using a KMS uh, key. Dead letter queue is when, uh, if there's an error or anything occurs, then um, there'll be a message on the dead letter queue. So if you know if the lander has failed to execute for some reason, you'll be able to go there. This is actually something that I've asked for as a feature request <coughs> from Amazon, and actually they delivered it. So it's always worth um, raising feature requests with Amazon. Again, the more they get, the, the more they change their roadmap. Um, so you've got to think of it in terms of, if you're processing data for Lambda, program defensively, think of it as a big data problem. So you may, for example, if you're ingesting JSON data, you may get invalid JSON on some of the rows. So if, you, if your Lambda gets 10,000 records, uh, you don't want to just throw away 10,000 records just for one invalid JSON row. So you need to program defensively, so you need to catch that exception almost. Uh, try and recover and then ignore it otherwise and keep going. Um, so again, it's about thinking about invalid records, so program like, a, like you would for big data, uh, especially for data processing. Um, I found also if you minimize logging um, into CloudWatch, that also speeds up some of the Lambda. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's quite funny. So once I was processing like uh, a thousand Lambdas in parallel, and there was an exception for every row for some reason. So it was writing like almost gigabytes of data into Cloud, CloudWatch. Um, so then obviously it was really slow. The landers were taking a long time and the logs were just filling up. So just be aware of um, how you log any issues. Think about also um, in terms of how the lander writes to Dynamo, for example. When you've got the counts, it's better to count in memory and then persist the aggregated counts rather than count every single row and write. So it's about optimizing your code really, which is, <coughs> it makes sense because you save money here, so. Yeah. <coughs> so what do you need to do in terms of one, two, three for those of you who haven't used Lambda yet? So first you need to think about uh, creating an IAM role. Um, so imagine you've got a resource, you have S3, um, you have, um, Dynamo, Kinesis Streams, the Lambda needs to actually read from there. So it needs to read that data in some way. So you need to create um, what's known as a policy, which is a JSON document that allows you to specific rights almost to the data. Um, then you can, um, you need to also create another policy, which is the Lambda execution role, which allows the Lambda to execute within a specific context. Um, so once that's done, you need to think about the actual Lambda code itself. So this is where you create configuration. That's where you choose actually the uh, amount of memory. Um, for example, the CPU, uh, not the CPU, the memory, and also the execution time, the maximum execution time, which is five minutes. You write your Java code, um, either your JavaScript, your Python, C Sharp code. And then what I found useful is to test it manually. So you can actually print the records from the event source into CloudWatch logs and then you can take that JSON document and then use that as a test to actually test manually with real data. Um, then you've got to think about the deployment. So I talked about the, um, the SAM model or the serverless frameworks or Chalice. So you think about how you're going to deploy the Lambda. Um, um, so if you did deploy it manually, you've tested it manually, you've deployed your code manually, you can just enable the event trigger. So that's when the Lambda starts executing almost. So, this is, uh, so it's telling the Lambda to run um, 
to read from Kinesis streams, for example, in micro batches, and then it will start executing. So this is like enabling it. Then monitor it again using CloudWatch. This is really, really important. Um, and also, yeah, the, the first million requests per month for free. So, you know, there's no excuse not to test it almost. So, yeah. Um, so there's lots of other use cases. I've just taken six different patterns that I think are useful. But again, there's lots of links I put on these slides. Uh, so these will be available. Um, thumbnail generation. So this is when uh, a file gets added to S3 and you want to generate a small file that's representative. Um, in order, for example, if you've got a mosaic of different images or photos, you want to generate those on the fly as they arrive. You've got various mobile backends. You can use it as a proxy. Um, IoT backends. You can use Alexa skills. So you know the machine that you can talk to in, as part of the home. So you can actually call a Lambda function from there and then decide to implement a specific skill. Um, you can use it for CloudTrail, again, around monitoring, around security. So rather than having a, a big machine actually going through all the logs, trying to understand what's happening, you can actually have a Lambda function. You can integrate it with Slack. So uh, you can have a Slack bot, for example, <coughs> that you speak with. Um, you can ask specific requests, and then the Slack bot can actually go back to, for example, RDS or Dynamo, look up something, and then do an answer. We could do some very simple machine learning uh, if you have that within the, the Lambda function itself. Um, so you could do some natural language processing in there. Also GitHub actions, so anything that gets checked in, for example, you can trigger uh, a Lambda function, <coughs> as well as the uh, cron jobs. So if you've got a job that runs once a day, you know, it's, it's a good way to do it. If it's a job that's on a file that's less than 400 megabytes several times a day, it's, it's quite a good scenario for that. Uh, so. Yeah, I've listed three of my different blog articles. So I've got one on the AWS Compute, um, on the time series real-time analytics, on the big data blog, on the Amazon one also. I've got my own Medium blog also. So these are the relevant blogs to what I talked about today. If you want all the code, all the technical details, um, I've written it in here. And I've also shared stuff publicly on GitHub. Um, so that's the address. There's also, from the reInvent, there's some other great talks that I recommend you have a look. Have a look at this link also. So it just talks about um, bigger companies, uh, or big companies that are also using uh, Lambda and serverless technologies. So some are, yeah, some are very interesting, so it's definitely worth looking at. <clears throat> so just to summarize today, so we talked about um, different challenges in the big data pipelines. So I talked about the beginning, about um, how a lot of companies and big data flows are using directed acyclic graphs and workflows. So I've proposed the event-driven ETL almost as a way around some of those uh, limitations. And we covered some of the serverless technologies, um, serverless computing. We've given you six different patterns. So we talked about more the messaging service bus. And then one pattern that's interesting to ingest lots of data. And then three different patterns to actually analyze the actual data that comes in. And um, the last one is to actually surface the data results almost. So you've got the capture, analysis in real time, um, and then the actual presentation of the data to an end user. Um, so recommendations, again, we talked about. Um, it's quite good to use some of the AWS managed services because they're actually integrated already. Uh, they're provided as an event source. They're also, uh, in terms of the security, in terms of um, how, how everything is interacted together in one package where you can monitor everything using uh, CloudWatch. Um, also, it's important to understand uh, the Lambda itself. So again, it's about uh, a serverless concept, but it's also about stateless side. So um, processing, for example, for failure, thinking about, um, as I said, thinking about in a big data way almost for streaming analytics. So. Just as a final point, I want to talk about uh, our motto again. So um, just ensure that no good cause goes unfunded at just giving. So it'd be great if you can use a bit of what I talked about today for good causes too um, in your area. So thank you. And I've got um, contact details there if you want to get in touch with me. So there's a LinkedIn address and also um, email. So thank you very much. I'll <laughs> So, um, do you have any questions, guys? Or we can go to the beers and then, yes, we have one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>
Can I add just the <coughs> microphone so we get recorded? Are you uploading these slides somewhere? Uh, yeah, I will, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's going to get recorded, and I think. Uh, yeah, and we will probably publish this on our YouTube channel, and the slides will be published on the, on the event, on the meetup, so they should be probably tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. So otherwise, uh, email me and, you know, if you have questions, but yeah. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> yeah, the front. Well, uh, nice presentation, by the way. I just was curious in, in some of your lambdas or your scenarios, you have mm -hmm. to deal with sensitive data and maybe by law or regulation or just because you yeah. need to encrypt. <coughs> Yeah, you can encrypt the data. But uh, do you do it or then? We encrypt uh, data in S3 and in Redshift. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lambda data that we process now, we're not, we're not encrypting. If I did encrypt it, it does run within a VPC, so it's locked down. Um, but yeah, you can encrypt it. You'd have to encrypt it before it arrives into Kinesis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, over there. So thanks, Richard, for yeah. the presentation. Okay. Um, how has the shape or the daily, the, the the life of the operation teams changed with uh, when you have introduced this? I mean, before mm -hmm. they were doing all the data ingest and manipulation some way, and yeah. now it's totally different. The only service that is related to hardware there mm. is probably RDS. So. Mm. How is the life of the people who's looking after this 24-7 change? With yeah, it's uh, been a big difference. So again, those people have managed to shift onto other operational areas. So we also have um, you know, the public sake website, the, the mobile app, the, um, we've got a back-end data, data, database, data warehouse. So they've managed to shift away from almost focusing on um, these sort of area, supporting this. So, so we found that, yeah, it, it will make a difference, anything that you do serverless on your operations team. No, I mean, I, I was meaning more on the load. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, despite the, the skills that needs to, to change or, or to adapt, uh, yeah. what about the load? I mean, the, are, are they more free than before? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But we, we got them doing other stuff now, so. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. You'll see, uh, as you start to use more managed services, there's almost less to maintain as you move away from EC2 instances and um, having a continuous integration pipeline around there, then yeah, there'll be less less load. Any other question? No. Well, then thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, it's a you, very man. nice talk and having you. We hope to have you again. Mm -hmm. And thank you to all of you guys. Uh,